Okay, so welcome everybody. Uh, we have our mini tutorial, Mixed Models, a critical tool for dependent observations. And the speaker is Dr. Elizabeth uh, Klesen. She is a research statistician developer at Jump Statistical Discovery. She has over a decade of experience in statistical modeling in a variety of software packages. Her interest is generalized linear models. Dr. Klassen earned a, a master's degree and a PhD in statistics from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, where she received the Holling Family Award for Teaching Excellence from the College of Agricultural Science and Natural Resources. She is an author of the third edition of SAS for Mixed Models and Introduction and Basic Applications and Jump for Mixed Models in 2021. Without further ado, Dr. Klassen. Thank you, Kayla. Thank you all for attending. I know there are a lot of options here at this conference to go to, and so I'm, I'm grateful to you all for coming. And I'm grateful to the DataWorks team for inviting me to present this. Whenever I include the thing about the teaching award, I always feel like the pressure is on that I have to show that I'm a good teacher now. Um, so, you know, that was back then in grad school, and it's a while, so hopefully we'll, we'll be there. Uh, so we're going to be talking about mixed models, and so just to give an overview of the, the things that we're going to be looking at. Um, so there are some various concepts that we have in mixed modeling with the fixed and the random effects, uh, correlation between experimental units, and different sized experimental units for different effects. What I'm going to be doing here today is I'm going to try to teach through example. There's, only, there's literally only one slide with formulas on it. And that's just because it, 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 it always comes up in a question, so I include it in case, in case we need it. And we're going to focus on sort of the conceptual idea of mixed models and how we take in a, a design. Uh, usually, usually with a mixed model, we're coming from some sort of designed experiment um, and turning that design into the model that we can fit in, in the software of choice. I'm with Jump, so we're going to be showing some Jump output. I do have some R code in, interspersed in a couple of places and also some SAS code if, if you're familiar with, if those are your packages of choice. Um, before I get started, how many people have done anything with mixed models before? Yay, hands up all the way. And then, and then we got some people shaking their heads. Nope, nope, no idea what you're talking about. Okay, so for those of you who have done mixed models before, a lot of this may feel very review. This is meant to be sort of introductory, um, but hopefully it'll be a good review. And we have some ideas that we use uh, in, in both the SAS book and the JUMP book. So even in the course of sort of the basic examples that I'm going to be going through, um, we have some, we have what we call a skeleton ANOVA process to help you take sort of a design. If you were not involved in designing the experiment and somebody just comes at you with your data and says, analyze this for me, it's, a, it's, a, it's sort of a thought process way of taking that description that you've got from, from your people who did the, and you know, went out and collected the, the data to turn it into the model to then fit into the software. And, I, and that's really kind of one of the key newer takeaways that um, I hope that uh, you can make use out of this, even if you've been doing mixed models and so everything else is review for you. Okay, so to get started, why do we use mixed models? Um, so we're gonna just start with, you know, what is a random effect? Um, mixed models, can possibly lead to different results for those estimates, confidence intervals, pairwise comparisons. The estimation method that we like, that we prefer with uh, mixed models is REML. Um, so we want to use that as opposed to the old school expected mean squares, particularly when you have uh, missing data or unequal group sizes. And then we're going to focus on the LS means rather than the old school arithmetic means. You know, that's what the software gives us anyway, so it's not. Um, yeah, so most of the time we're not looking at arithmetic means anymore, but you know, every once in a while somebody's like, well, this, the mean that you've given me here, if I go and just calculate the mean of this group, it, they don't match, and so why, why is that happening? So we'll talk a little bit about that. So we'll start, we have uh, this bond data, and basically what the, the, um, they were wanting to do uh, was to take uh, th these metal ingots, they broke them apart, they welded them back together, and then they wanted to, um, test the breaking strength of that metal bond. So you take, you take your piece of metal, you bond it back together, and then essentially break it again to see how well that, that weld will hold. 
so old school, completely randomized design. We've got our, I think it's 21 uh, pieces of metal going across there. All of them have been randomized, one of three different treatments. And so, you know, it's not a mixed model. It's just a completely randomized design. We would go forth, analyze it, and be happy. But what happens if we start with an ingot of metal that we then divide into three of those experimental units that we break, apply our bonding treatment, and then break again? You know, we have this sort of block now. We have these three experimental units. They all came from the same ingot. They're probably going to behave in a similar manner when they get welded back together. And, in, and those ingots are kind of, they're going to have differences between them. And so we essentially have this restriction on our randomization. We have those three experimental units within each, um, each of these blocks that came from the ingots. And so we, we want to make sure that each of our treatments get randomized to each of the blocks. So this is a randomized complete block design, three treatments. We have the three experimental units within. And so we have that restriction on randomization, and that's sort of where we now are into um, mixed model territory provided we think of these blocks as random. So we have this block, do we treat it as fixed or do we treat it as random? So I've been throwing around these terms, fixed effect, random effect, what do we mean by that? So with a fixed effect, it's when you care about exactly those levels that you're looking at. You want to make some sort of inference of, um, for a future observation or whatever from exactly those levels. So in the bond data, it's those three treatments that we're interested in. Um, that we're, we want to see which one has the, the um, greatest bonding strength. But then a random effect, if the levels of the, that effect are basically a sample from a larger population. So we chose those seven ingots to turn into our experimental units at random from our great big pile of ingots over here. <laughs> um, and so we want to make some sort of inference about this bonding strength to that larger population of ingots, not just to that specific um, the collection of ingots that we used in our, in our experiment. And then also, you know, if you're just interested in explaining the variability that's coming from, from that effect, you don't care did ingot one, you know, have you know, stronger bonding strength than ingot two, we don't care. It's just a source of variability that's within our experiment that we need to account for so that our, our inferences about those metals that we use for the bond itself are sort of correctly accounted for. So the question to ask yourself if you're thinking about a, 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 an effect, like a blocking effect, is it, should it be fixed or random? Do I care about just those levels that I saw, just those seven ingots? Or do I want to understand which is going to work best on sort of any future ingot that I grab out of the pile? So another example quick, uh, this one perfect for after lunch. We've got some pretzels here. We're going to conduct this experiment on baking some pretzels. We have ovens on four consecutive days. We're going to test four different alkaline substances to see which one makes better pretzels. There's an argument about should a pretzel be hard or should a pretzel be soft? Answer soft. <laughs> um, but you know, that's to be made. And, and so, you know, we're we're going in, we're gonna test these alkaline substances to see which is the better pretzel. And so we can ask ourselves, if we're all in this room going to do this experiment, can we all use the same four alkaline substances? This is classroom participation. You can nod yes or no in, in agreement. So if we're gonna, if we want to test it, we could all use those same alkaline substances. Obviously, I, you can't use the exact same want, amount that I use, but we're all getting it out of the bottle together. We're interested in those four alkaline substances. Can we use the same oven? No. As soon as I have put mine in the oven, you can't use this oven. You got to go use a different oven. Do we want to make inference on only those four substances? Yes, that's sort of obvious. And are we interested in only those ovens that we're using today? No, because I want to know. I you know if I'm if I'm a global manufacturer, I, you know, and I'm going to have people all over the world making these in in ovens all around the world. You know, I don't care about the oven. I want to know about that alkaline substance to make my pretzel consistent. 
so here's, you know, I'm just going to dive in. We're going to just look at some results here with this bond data. Um, haven't talked about how to get the model or anything. We're just going to talk about what happens and uh, whether we treat these um, ingots as a random effect or a fixed effect, and then we'll work backwards to how we got we sort of set up this model to begin with. So if we treat that um, the the ingot as a random effect, uh, we get our our covariance parameters here. So we have a variance estimate for the ingot of about 11.4, and then our residual variance, and then so we have a you know measure of the total variance that we have in our experiment there. And then we come down and we look at our fixed effect tests and we can see that, you know, we have our two degrees of freedom for metal. It looks like we do have, you know, a significant difference going on um, between those metals. And so we can kind of continue through, take a look at, you know, the least squares means that we get. So we have copper, iron, and nickel. And so 70, almost 76, and 71. So it looks like copper and nickel are pretty similar, iron clearly a stronger bonding agent. We look at those pairwise differences. Iron's significantly different from both, so it's almost you know, 5.7 um, units. I don't know what the units were measured in. Uh, stronger than the copper bond, and then 4.8 units stronger than the nickel bond. Both of those are different. But we can see that we have no evidence here that copper and nickel are, are particularly different. I just said that, and here we are highlighting it. And of course, we have our confidence intervals, because you know it's not just about the mean; it's also about that variation, um, and then also for the pairwise differences. I did use the Tukey Kramer adjustment for multiplicity here. I only have three treatments. I'm not sure that that really did anything in this case, but it is a, you know something to bear in mind when when you're running the experiments uh, to control that false discovery rate. So just the basics of the output, what we're looking at, how we sort of look at those differences. And so you're like, well, why should I bother using a mixed model? Why can't I just use include that random effect in a fixed effect, and I can be very happy in my, my least squares world over here? What happens if I do that? So here's our results from before with the random ingots. We're going to put it side by side with the, the fixed effects. And here I'm showing, I have actually two different platforms within Jump. On the left is the standard least squares, which is available in, in Jump, and then the Fit Mixed platform, which is a Jump Pro only version in Fit Model. So that's why they're a little bit different. Um, and so we can see that, you know, basically our, our decision about, you know, whether there's a difference in the metal, it didn't change. You know, our, 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 our um, you know, we have a sum of squares there, which we don't really have, but we, our, we have our F ratio, that's exactly the same, and our P value, F ratio and P value over here, those are exactly the same. Why, why should I do, do this differently if that conclusion is, this, is exactly the same? Well, one, ingot was in the model to explain the variance. We don't care about those levels of ingot. It's really about the variability there. So, that's a good reason why maybe we should include it as a random effect. But then also, if we look at um, those confidence intervals, get them both up here, for the, um, just for the least squares means, we can see here that in the, in the model where we have the random ingots, our standard error there for those estimates is, is higher because we're including that variability to do to ingot in that variability for, to get our confidence interval um, and, and you know, our, t our, our test, whether it's different from zero or so whatever. <laughs> Obviously, it's different from zero, but particularly for that confidence interval. And so our confidence intervals are a little bit wider because that standard error is a little bitter because we're including that variability in, in, that, in that estimate so that we, can say, well, you know, we don't have one of those seven ingots. We've already used them. We've got, we're using a new one, so we're, we're just a little more, little more unsure about what's, what's happening. But then down in, so yeah, so here we go. So if we do treat it as a, as a um, fixed effect versus a random effect, it affects those um, confidence intervals for the fixed effects, but it does not affect for the um, for the differences, 
So as soon as we do that pairwise difference, essentially that block effect cancels out. Um, and so it doesn't, it doesn't make a difference when it comes to making that decision about which one is stronger or the estimate or the confidence interval for that. It's just if we wanted to say, we're pretty sure, or you know, we think that um, you know, iron is gonna have a breaking strength of 75.9 and here's our confidence interval about that. Um, that's where it comes in. But if we just wanted to say, you know, iron is stronger than copper, you know, that it doesn't matter which one we're looking at. And it, it doesn't affect the confidence intervals here if the design is balanced. So that is a kind of a key point there. If we have missing data for some reason that makes it unbalanced, um, then it's, uh, that no longer holds. So what happens? Kind of alluded to it there. What happens if those groups aren't balanced, or we don't, or we have data missing? And here's where we're going to talk a little bit about those methods of estimation. So back in the old days, and I say old days because there's some older folks in here. Sorry. Um, you know, before computers got to be awesome, when they were doing their their um, their ANOVAs to determine to do these estimations and, and their uh, analyses. They had everything was calculated by hand: sums of squares, mean squares, um, expected mean squares, to to get their calculations. And that was fine and dandy and worked great when you had to calculate everything by hand. As soon as we have um, computers that are able to do so much, so much, uh, everything so much faster and better, there's a better way that's called restricted maximum likelihood or residual maximum likelihood, depending on which camp you're in. Um, we'll call it REML. And the nice thing about REML is it can handle missingness and imbalance in a way that expected mean squares can't. So if we take a look here, we um, basically we took the bond data and just deleted a couple of observations from it. And we take a look and in the least squares platform we can actually get the, the column that has what the arithmetic mean was. So if we went just went to the data table, took the, the mean observation, we can see that. And if we compare that to the estimate that we get from the least squares means, thanks to the REML um, algorithm, we can see that they're not the same. Um, and that's because it's the, the algorithm's able to make use of information about, essentially about um, those observations that we're missing. You know, we have, say, two out of the three observations on this ingot. So based on that information, we can sort of, we can in, sort of interpolate in a way about how we think that the behavior of, of the other observation is going to be. They would call that recovery of interblock information, if you want the fancy term for it. Um, and so it's just a little bit better of an estimate because we're sort of able to use the other information in our experiment to sort of understand what might have happened if we hadn't lost that particular piece of data. Um, so, you know, if we wanted to predict the mean when the metal was copper, which one should we use? I'm going to argue the least squares mean estimate, not the arithmetic mean. If I wanted to, if I have a regression case here, so I have a, a, an X predictor that goes from, you know, 6 to 14 and our response, you know, when I want to go to predict our mean, you know, what should I do there when, I, when my X is between 14 and 16, you know, because those observations, they look, you know, they're actually, you know, quite a bit above where the regression line is. You know, should I use the regression line? Should I, you know, use the actual observation that I saw there? And so, you know, the, using the REML can help us sort of make a better prediction even when our data are a little offline there. We have a question on Zoom. Sure. So can you please explain least square mean? I thought random effects models were not fit with least squares. Uh, right. So random effects models aren't fit with least squares. Um, the terminology sort of just lingers on. <laughs> um, it's, this, it's the same idea. Typically, a lot of times, instead of calling it a least squares means, we'll just call it an LS mean. Because the idea is sort of the same, but it's not using the least squares algorithm. Um, so it's just sort of a holdover in terminology as we moved into moved into into Remo land. <laughs> That's a good question. I'll pause and grab a drink of water. 
Um, so if we take a look here at our at our pairwise differences, um, apparently here with this one, I don't remember the point of this slide. I am so sorry. Uh, oh, there we go. If we take a look at um, when we when we look at it with the, treating the ingot as fixed versus as with random, we can see again our standard errors um, for the. Ooh, let me make sure I'm hitting the right one. That's the pairwise. Here's our means. So our standard errors for our means are are larger again because we're including that variability due to 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 the ingot. But then for our differences, they're similar, but they're not exactly the same uh, because of that missingness. Um, and, and in the case of treating it as a fixed effect, we sort of lose that ability to, to, um, to, uh, to, to, un to understand what happened with that missing data when, when we treat that ingot as, as a fixed effect. When it's when it's a when it's treated as a random effect, we can sort of say, oh well, you know, if it was randomly missing, we can sort of we can sort of figure out what's going on. If it's a fixed effect, no, we saw this. We we don't know anything about what happened over there when we're looking at this over here. And so it gives us the ability to sort of get um, a better idea of the variability um, for those pairwise differences. So here's just uh, a little graph of sort of the difference between um, the arithmetic mean and our, our least squares means, whether it was treating it as a, a fixed effect or as a random effect. And so we can see that both um, treating it as fixed, which is in the, where we have it SLS, you know, those are pretty similar. They're a little bit different, but they're pretty similar. But that mixed um, confidence interval is, is wider, again, because we're including that variability due to the ingot in, in that confidence interval for that mean. So just to summarize here as we're getting started, if we're dealing um, with random effects, you're dealing with random effects when those levels are from a larger population, or if you're primarily interested in just explaining that variability. You know, we have that we have this effect, but it's just a source of variability. We don't care about the levels. We don't want those pairwise comparisons. Um, if you treat that random effect as fixed, it's going to have an effect on those standard errors and those confidence intervals. And so they're going to be, you know, a little less appropriate. You know, famous saying, all models are wrong, but some are useful. Right? <laughs> We've all heard that a thousand times. So they're, both of those mo both of these models are probably wrong, whether we treat it as fixed or random. Random is probably a little more useful, and you know the phrase you know I'm, this one's a little harsher. When you know better, do better. Um, it's a, it's a source of variability where that we're only interested in in explaining is variability. So we should treat it as random, and so if we know that, then we should do that. And then, you know, just to recap, LS means not necessarily the arithmetic means. That missing data and the imbalance means we need to use the REML. Um, and then the pairwise comparisons, if there is that missing data or imbalance, are, are also affected there. And then a point, you know, we, I sort of just glossed over p-values a little bit, but we want to make this point early and often. We don't necessarily want to rely on the p-value. You know, there's the whole p-value controversy about replicability and stuff these days. Remember that a p of 0.049 is essentially the same as a p of 0.5, but one is the glorious I'm under 0.05, and I mean, use the brain a little bit. <laughs> and so you're basically the same thing. So bear that in mind as, as we're moving forward. I, you know, we talk about p-values a lot and making our decisions based on that, but especially when they're sort of borderline, we'll err on the side of, hey, probably something's going on. So I just dove in there and we just, you know, magically fit the model behind the scenes and presented the results. So I want to talk about how we can determine what a sensible model is. Um, and so we're going to repurpose that ANOVA table that I alluded to earlier. We don't have to calculate those expected mean squares anymore. It doesn't have that same purpose as it did back in the day. Um, but, you know, so they were desi originally designed to aid us in the construction of those F-tests to determine whether uh, an effect was significant. So they had the, the source of variation, the degrees of freedom, expected mean squares, your F-ratios. Software does that for us. 
Yay, we don't have to do anything by hand. And but the, the ANOVA itself, that table can be, we can still make use of it to help us describe what we can, we're calling the sensible model. So we can include the sources of variation, those sources that came from the experiment design itself, blocks, experimental units, any sort of thing like that, and then also the treatment design, whether we have a single factor or some sort of factorial, is it a regression model or a, a, you know, an ANOVA model? And then we want to have basically a one-to-one -one match between the effects that we're listing in that ANOVA table and the model parameters that we're, for this model that we're going to fit. And so this is where um, what we refer to as the skeleton ANOVA came into existence. And I will credit this to uh, Walt Stroop at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. He was my advisor. And he came up with this process um, based on an article that was in, I think it was in the American Statistician. I should have put the reference here. Now I can't remember. Um, that it was, it was in, in, he, he originally called it, what would Fisher do? Because it was, it was these comments that were made um, way back in, you know, in the 30s when Fisher was doing his thing. And he basically said, if you can describe what the experiment looks like and you can describe, describe what the treatment looks like, everything else should just fall into place and you'll be able to build the model. Because Fisher was frustrated with these crazy models that people were trying to put forth to analyze this data. He's like, it should be clear how to proceed. And Walt looked at that and he said, yes, that is true. We can do this. He says, because, you know, as an instructor, when people are just learning modeling, he would see some very interesting models. And so he said, we're going to help people try and come up with, with the right model. And so we start, we have our, our, our table there. We have the experiment design, treatment design, and then sort of what's going to be our final skeleton or NOVA. And we start with our experiment design. So in our bond data, we had our ingots that we chose. We had seven of them, minus one for our degrees of freedom for six. And then we had the, we split each of those ingots into three so that we had essentially three experimental units per ingot. So we have our degrees of freedom there, it's three minus one times the seven ingots for 14. And we have our grand total of 20 degrees of freedom. Everything should nicely add up, knock on wood. So we had 20 observations minus one for 20. I left a space here because when we move over to the treatment design, the treatments are applied to those splits that we made to the ingot. So not, there's no treatment that's applied to the ingot itself. The treatment gets applied to that third, you know, one of the thirds that came off of the ingot. And so we kind of put it on the line above the experimental unit where that treatment was applied. So we had three metals, so we have two degrees of freedom for that. And then basically we slide everything over. There weren't any treatments, uh, tr treatments applied to the ingot, so it just comes over uh, as it is, ingot with its six degrees of freedom. We have metal with its two degrees of freedom. And then that ingot third that we had after accounting for the metal, this is where putting the, the treatments above the line where they're essentially where they're applied, we lose the two degrees of freedom for metal off of the, the degrees of freedom for the ingot. And so we ha essentially have 12 degrees of freedom for the residual. Still add up to our total 20 degrees of freedom in the model. And I made um, the ingot and this ingot third that's our residual into red to identify that they came from the experiment design. And so because they came from the experiment design, obviously residual in a linear mixed model land, that's, that's our Gaussian residual, that's obviously random because that's, that's our error term, our error variance. But the ingot was also living in that same experiment design. And so everything, basically everything that's in the experiment design comes across and becomes a random effect. So it's another argument that ingots should be random because it's part of the experiment design, not a treatment. So then we can take this, we put together the ANOVA and we can, we can build our model. And we should have essentially a one-to-one -one, um, from our source ANOVA table here to the model equation that we're trying to write and then that will then fit into, into whatever software we're using. So we can write it out. We have our yij's equals to the intercept. 
intercepts not on the skeleton ANOVA, but that's what we always get for free from most software unless we tell it not to fit an intercept. Then we have our, our RJ for the ingot, A alpha I for the metal, and the EIJ for that residual error. And so then we spell out all of those. We assume that that random, because the ingot effect came across from the, the, from the experiment design, that it's a random effect with its own um, distribution there, normal zero sigma squared sub r, and then our residual error, uh, normal zero sigma squared. Here's the one slide with formulas because it comes up because that question, because uh, we pointed out the difference in the standard errors, whether we treat it as fixed or random. Um, so we can look at you know, the estimation of the treatment means, particularly when you look at the variance. If the, if the, um, that random effect is treated as, treated as random, <laughs> if the block effect is treated as random, then when we calculate the variance for that treatment mean, we see that that's where, that's why that we, we have the, the higher standard error because we have the variance in there for the, for the random effect. This is a little bit of abusive um, notation, but I think it gets the point across. Then in the treatment difference, you know, when we get our estimate for the treatment one, it's just alpha, alpha one minus alpha two. And then our variance for our treatment just depends on the residual. So that's why whether we treat it as fixed or random, when we looked at the treatment difference, we didn't see a different when we didn't see a difference in the standard error there, um, because when it's the the difference, it only depends on that residual variance. So there, there's your there's your equations. You're all happy now. <laughs> Do you have any questions at this point? It's a good point to sort of pause and gauge how things are going. All right. So that was essentially the randomized complete block design. What happens, you know, do we treat it as random? Because that's sort of right in its name, randomized complete block design or fixed. So now we're going to move on and we're going to talk a little bit about models with factorial designs. And so we're going to, you know, we're going to, we're going to dive sideways here a little bit. What is a factorial design and why would we use one? You know, you're in a mixed models workshop. Why are we talking about factorials in a mixed model workshop? We'll get to that. And then sort of what happens beyond the split plot? Um, you know, so we can have, so maybe, you know, here in our graph here, we have treatments that got applied sort of in strips, and then maybe we had another treatment that was randomized across there. So we have some sort of uh, split plot sort of visualization there. And so we can go beyond the split plot to split split plot and so on and crazy extensions. So first let's talk briefly about factorials. So it occurs when an experiment has two or more treatment factors of interest. Hopefully everybody in this room isn't still doing experimentation with one factor at a time. I think we're all probably in this group we're all we've all moved beyond that. So we, we probably we know about factorials. We have more than one one treatment factor. Um, so we know that they're more efficient than one factor at a time. We can reduce the number of experiments, and so the experimental units, you know, rockets are expensive. We can't blow them up very often. <laughs> um, plus, it enables the measurement of interactions between those factors. You know, if we do one factor at a time, we never know that the fuel and the temperature will interact some way. Shocking, I know. Um, and then we get uh, improved statistical properties for the main effects and simple effects. I will define those shortly. Um, and then factorial treatments are often used with the split plot experiment design. We have one factor that's harder to change than, than the other one. And so that hard to change factor is what we call the whole plot factor. And the easier to change is the split plot factor. And that's really where we get into mixed model land. Because as soon as you have a split plot, you have to fit a mixed model. So I, I use the phrase interaction. So it occurs when the effect of one factor changes given the level of the other factor. So it's time for class participation again. If we looked at this graph of at least squares means, LS means, and we looked at that, would we say there's interaction going on there? No, correct. 
no interaction. It looks like our effects are exactly the same, um, no matter sort of which, you know, if we held B constant, our effect of A is the same, or if we hold A constant, our effect of B is the same. No interaction going on. How about in this graph? Yes, okay. definitely. Oh, most definitely, yes, exactly. As soon as, that's sort of classic interaction. As soon as we have the crossing of the lines there, definitely an interaction going on. If we're in B0, A1 is, is better than A0. These are, of course, are numbered backwards. And in B, B1, that is completely reversed. So, yep, green check, we have interaction. How about this one? Yep, exactly. Definitely have interaction again there. If we look at, again, at the, uh, the effect of A given we're in B1, essentially we have no effect of A there. You know, there's, it looks like they're about the same. At least we can't, at least in this particular experiment, we can't, we can't tell that there's a difference in those treatments. But as soon as we get to B1, A1 shoots off. There's some, some synergy going on there. So when you have B1 and, and A1 together, boom, we're way off. So and another example of interaction. So you don't necessarily have to have the crossing. It's sort of the diverging it works as well. So I said main effects and simple effects. Uh, a main effect we can look at when there's negligible interaction. So if we're sort of in the, in the Goldilocks land of the parallel lines, it's, the main effect is defined as the effect of a single factor averaging over any uh, other factor that's in the model. Because we've determined there's no interaction, it doesn't matter what level of the other factor we use. So we can just sort of use, you know, quote, the average level or the average effect. And, you know, we can use the LS means comparisons of that factor itself to make decisions about, you know, our optimal factor se settings. But what if our interaction is non-negligible? What if we have that crossing going on? We have to look at the simple effects. And so it's the effect of one factor given the level of the other factor. Um, so by definition, it's when that simple effect changes depending on the level of the other factor. So we looked at that. We said, you know, A1 behave, was, was higher with, with, um, with B0 and then it was lower with, with uh, B1. So that simple effect of A changed depending on which level of B we were at. So that, that's, that's sort of the formal definition of what an interaction is. And mathematically, that's how it's calculated. And so we look at slices of the interaction LS means in order to determine you know, what our optimal factor settings might be. So um, Dr. Shute, my advisor's wife, is a professor in uh, plant breeding. And so this is actually from her, one of her experiments one time. It's, it's these lovely pots or poinsettias. Um, so she had uh, two plant varieties and a pesticide that was meant to protect the plants against the disease. The amount of pesticide can be applied basically in sections of the greenhouse benches. And those bench sections can hold multiple plants. From past experiments, they know that uh, there's variability between the benches in the greenhouse. So we should probably block on, on those benches. I'm a big fan of drawing a picture. If I was getting this data and I, you know, I was not involved in the design of the experiment, I would say, draw me a picture of what you did. And they'll say, okay. So here we have a picture. We've got our picture. This is a, a single bench in the greenhouse. And in the, in, in the bench, because of the drip irrigation to apply the pesticide, they can apply it basically to sections. So we have the four sections within the bench. And then within each of those sections, they can assign put, put two plants. And so we have a susceptible plant and a resistant plant, and that gets randomized into position in each of those. And then there were multiple, obviously multiple benches going on. Um, and so you see that, and you can start to go, okay, so we've got the bench, we've got the divisions within the bench, and then we've got those plants within those, those, um, those divisions. So let's build our model. So we start, got our block, could have said bench, because that's kind of specifically what it is here. It's our blocking factor. In this case, we had five benches, so we have four degrees of freedom. As we said, we've divided those into four splots. So those, that's our whole plot. So I said, you know, the whole plot within the block. So we had four of those minus one times the five blocks gives us 15 degrees of freedom for the, 
for the whole plot. And then the split plot within the whole plot, we have two, you know, two spots for those plants to go, um, minus one times the 20 total locations that we had, five benches, four, per, four spots per bench for 20 degrees of freedom. And our, that should add up to our total of uh, 39 degrees of freedom because we had 40 observations total. Come to the treatment design. We had the dose that was applied to those whole plots, so it's living in the line above the whole plot. That was weird. It's really big. Let's change there. Um, and then we had the type, the type of plant that was randomized to the split plot, and that's also where we can measure that type by dose interaction. So we have the two, uh, we had two types, so we have one degree for degree of freedom for type, and then the interaction itself has three degrees of freedom, the dose degrees times the type degrees, and that's measured at that individual plant. So both the type and the interaction are essentially measured at the split plot level. Bring everything across, nothing was applied to the block, so those come across as is, dose comes across, and then those degrees of freedom are taken away from the whole plot degrees of freedom. So instead of the 15, we have 12, because 15 minus three. And that can be defined as essentially the block by dose, block by dose interaction. You know, if I know what block I, if I know what block I have and I know what dose was applied, I can go tell you exactly where I was in the, in the experiment, basically. It tells me which whole plot I was in. Um, the type, type by dose, those are, are treatment effects that come across it they, as is, and then those degrees of freedom are taken away from the split plot, uh, which is then our residual error. So we can see here a little more complicated design than we had with our block design, but just thinking through how, how, the, how the design was set up, the, the benches, the whole plots, and the, and the space available within those whole plots, where those treatments were applied, you know, did we apply anything to the block? No. Did we, we applied things to the whole plot? We can sort of, we can get everything set up here so that we can define our model accurately so that we end up with the right degrees of freedom uh, for all of our tests and things. So we bring everything across, spell it out there. We've been through it sort of, everybody's seen model equations forever, so we won't linger here too long. Just noting that we do because block was on the experiment design, we're gonna treat it as random, so it has a variance. The whole plot variance, um, and then our split plot, or the which is, becomes the residual variance. So those are our tr three random terms in the model. And then of course our fixed effects for dose treatment, and then our dose by treatment. Um, so then in, I'm gonna, sh in jump here, if I can get my pen to go away so that I can play the video. Um, so we just sort of, we just fit the model, you know, before with the bond data, we'll show you how we actually do it in jump. Fit your Y into Y. We want the type by dose. Those are our fixed effects, so we'll do that. And we want to uh, fit essentially the full factorial, so we can use that macro button to get that. So we get our type, our dose, and our type by dose interaction. So that's taken care of those fixed effects. I'm gonna switch the personality to mixed model because it's a little more clear where um, we can fit the, the random effects in. You can actually fit this model using uh, the least squares personality. But on the random effects tab then we can include the block and we want to include the block by dose because that identifies that whole plot. So that's gonna be our whole plot variance. The residual we don't define anywhere because that's sort of like the intercept, we get that for free but um, it'll, it'll fit there. And then we hit run. Whee! We don't need to play it again, thanks. So we can take our look at our results there. That is small for you guys, I apologize. It was not that small before, but it is really small with what I'm looking at here. Um, <laughs> and we can see that we've got our block variance our block by dose, that's our whole plot variance, and our residual, so we've accounted for everything there. And we have our fixed effects parameter estimates table. 
We can take a look at our actual by predicted and actual by conditional predicted plots. And so just a sense of how well our model is doing fitting. The actual by predicted plot uses um, just the, the fixed effect parameters to, to do the predictions. So it's essentially um, ignoring which block it was in. It's saying, you know, we're just, it's just the, the, the prediction on its own without any information about the block. When we say the conditional predicted, basically we're saying what is our conditional prediction? What is our effect, um, including the effect of whatever block and whole plot it was in? Um, so typically this is what you'll see. You'll see, you know, this is a, I'm, I'm not, this is a pretty good fit um, in, the, in the actual by predicted. And then almost always, as soon as you look at the conditional predicted, it, because we're the, the effect of the block that's in there um, is used in that prediction equation, it typically is, you know, it's, it's a better prediction because you're using all the information you have about that, that observation um, to, to do that prediction. So those look pretty good. Uh, if we take a look at our tests, we can see here, this is where um, using the, the split plot come in, in the mixed model is, is necessary because the dose was applied to the whole plot. And remember, we had the, the 12 degrees of freedom uh, that were part of the, the whole plot variance. And so we can see that we're using the whole plot variance for our test um, uh, for that whole plot effect, for that dose effect. And that appears to be the, the lone I just realized I'm circling things with the pointer, and I'm not sure you can see that. Um, sort of the lone um, statistically significant effect in the model. The type by dose, not technically sign statistically significant, you know, it's not, not in the bright red, it's 0.11. It's not a very big experiment. And what I'd like to point out is it is uh, what we call a three degree of freedom test, you know, because we have three. Um, three degrees of freedom for dose. And so it's basically averaging uh, several tests together to get that p-value. And so I tend to be a little more um, conservative about my alpha level uh, with, with uh, interactions. And I often say I'm going to be a little, I might say that my, my alpha for an interaction test might be, um, say, 0.2. Provided it's not an experiment that I have designed specifically for power for that test, <laughs> there's always a caveat there. If I've, if I've designed it to have power to detect that interaction and I don't have interaction, you know, it's not statistically significant, then I'm, gonna, I'm sort of going to throw that one out the window. But, you know, if somebody just came to me and, you know, they hadn't specifically powered, powered their test for this, I'd be inclined to go, well, you might have an interaction going on here. And we'll take a look at that a little in a, in a little bit. First here, we'll say, uh, now it's, it's not less than 0.05, p.05. So I have no interaction. The only significant effect I have is dose. So let's just look at the, at the effect of dose there. And we can see that basically dose one um, is um, less than, yes, sorry, less than um, doses two, four, and eight at, you know, at a significant level. But we don't particularly have, um, you know, we don't have any strong uh, evidence that there's a difference between two, four, two, and eight, or or four and eight. So clearly, going from dose one to dose two does something. Um, but then from two to four, four to two to uh, and four to eight, maybe not so much. So if I were if I were looking to to um, decrease the amount of, of damage from these pests. Maybe dose two of the pesticide is sufficient, um, you know, because a lot of times you don't want to apply more pesticide than, than is needed uh, because of the environmental effects that you might have. But certainly you need more than, more than just dose one. So, but what happens if, um, if I look at that p-value for that interaction and I say, eh, it's sort of borderline because it's 0.11, um, you know, maybe there's some sort of interaction going on. Let's let's go ahead and take a look at at the the effect of, of type by dose that interaction term, and see if we can see what's what's going on and why that might sort of be borderline. And so we can get our visualization here, and we can see that um, you know for dose one, 
like we saw um, when we were just looking at dose, it is clearly less than the other doses. But when we look at doses two, four, and eight up here, we see a little bit of that crossing going on. So, you know, there's certainly no interaction of anything with involving sort of, of dose one, but with those others, there might be something going on there. Um, hard to, you know, hard to say. But that's why that p-value was sort of marginal. You know, there's no interaction here, but there is maybe a little bit hiding up in those other terms. And so that's why we might consider looking at, um, um, just looking at the, at the interaction term and looking at the simple effects. So if we look at the simple effects, we have to um, we get our, all of our, our uh, differences here, our pairwise differences for, for type and dose. And it literally is all of those pairwise differences, but only some of them are sort of valid. Because remember, if, we're, if we have an interaction, we have to look at the difference when we're holding one of those, um, one of those uh, terms constant. So if we, we can kind of go through and identify here well, in, the, in this first batch, we're holding um, the type constant as at the resistant type and looking at the doses, dose one to two, one to four, et cetera, and sort of, you know. So I went through and sort of highlighted the ones that were, are sort of the valid ones to look at. Ultimately, in this case, regardless of um, sort of this interaction that we're seeing here, these aren't sort of statistically st significantly different up here our conclusions end up being the same about sort of regardless of which type of plant resistant or susceptible it looks like probably dose two is where we want to be because it, it gives you better response than dose one and it's not different from from the doses two and four we have, at least we have no evidence of that people always ask me if this is if we're, if if these are the only ones that are valid to look at why do you give me all of those you're correct in SAS, there's an option in the LS means comparisons where you can slice by a particular factor, and it will um, it will it will only give you the ones where you're holding one of those levels constant. It's an outstanding request in Jump in our in our multiple comparisons tool. I, I hear it's in the works, but I can't guarantee when it might happen. In the meantime, you sort of have to look at everything if you're using Jump to get these and and tease out the ones you're you're interested in. So then sort of beyond the split plots, we can have factorial treatments with sort of other experiment designs. And then, you know, sort of there's a bunch of extensions beyond just the basic split plot. We can split split plot. We can strip split plot and sort of all sorts of combinations of any of those. We could have a nested design. So we only observe factor B0 when we're in particular levels of factor A that sort of thing. And often when we're designing that, it looks like a split plot and it often is analyzed in the same way. But, you know, when you get sort of a complicated um, strip split plot or a split split plot or any of those, working through that, um, that skeleton or NOVA process can help you identify, you know, wh where's my correct error term for this particular treatment to get that model defined correctly. Okay, so do we have questions at this point? Yes, in the back. In the non pearl version of Jump, yes. how do we run that analysis? Is that fit model and then GLM as the method? No, so um, in, in, uh, in the non pearl version, you would use the standard least squares um, personality. And then back in the, in the model dialogue, um, um, you won't get the tabs across it fixed and random, but in the under one of the red triangle menus, it, it's you can specify what's a random effect. So basically, you put all of your effects in that window, and you and you flag the particular ones as random. So all of these models that were done so far can be fit either in in the least squares or mixed. When we get towards the end, we'll we'll actually see a model that can only be fit in in the pro uh, version. It's a good question. Thanks. What is the strip in strip split? So in a strip split plot, um, it's kind of like the um, it's kind of like the first that first graphic that I showed. It's it's a strip going down or across, um, and so it's it, it's so a treatment can get applied sort of in in a strip going through 
um, I haven't seen one in a while, so it's hard to. Okay. I was, I was thinking. Think yeah, I, I was, I was. Yeah, yeah. I always, I was thinking of it in terms of you know, I came from Nebraska, so agriculture, right? You know, you're out in a field, and say you, we want to apply a pesticide and a seed or something. Well, big giant planters and pesticide applying. We can only apply, say, a strip going across this way, but then we can apply the other strip going that way down the field. And so like the interaction is in where they intersect, so that's sort of the split plot, but we have a strip this way and a strip that way. Um, yeah, where, the, where a treatment gets applied sort of fully across and fully across. Any questions online? All good? Okay. Okay. That's good. Actually, that's just about right. So, um, just like we could have several treatment effects and, and sort of cross them or nest them, we can also do that with random effects. So we can have multiple random effects besides, say, the block and the whole plot that we have in the model. Uh, the Latin square is sort of a special kind of, of those crossed random effects. So we're going to look at a Latin square design and sort of how to how to go about. Um, looking at that, analyzing it. Uh, so this is some fabric shrinkage data. Uh, manufacturer needs to test four new materials uh, in permanent press garments. They have a heat treatment that can be used to test those and has four positions that we can sort of put it in that, in that, um, in that chamber. And um, so each fabric should be tested under each position because you know maybe there's a gradient, temperature gradient in our heat chamber. And due to sort of time constraints, we can only have four runs. <laughs> you know, it takes a while for, for this heat chamber to heat up and use it and whatever. And so, and we're interested in sort of the fabric shrinkage. So we have four materials that we're interested in. We have four positions. We have four runs. Everything's in fours. It's sort of, hey, Latin square. <clears throat> so we can set that up. We take a look. And so we have sort of run one, two, three, and four. And if you look through, hopefully you will see that uh, the randomization has been so that each of these different fabrics is in each of the different positions. So if we say, look at the purple shirt, it's in position two, three, one, and four. And that should hopefully be the same for all of them. Um, and so special kind of thing, like a Latin square. We like to reference Sudoku. Sudoku is a fancy Latin square. It's basically what we're doing. Each observation is, occurs once in each column and once in each row. Sudoku has that additional restriction in that in each of the corners, but you know, it's a fancy Latin square. So what do we do? How do we get a model for that? So our skeleton ANOVA, we have the run and the position. We're not assigning a treatment to run and position. They're just sort of our random effects. They're they're blo essentially blocking factors. Um, each of those we had four of, so we have three degrees of freedom in each. And then our run by position, that's our experimental unit where we're, you know, where we're measuring our, um, our shrinkage observation with uh, nine degrees of freedom total. Add it all up, we, have, we had 16 observations because we have four by four by four by four, uh, and so 15. Then our material that got randomized to the run and the position under all those restrictions. So that's why it lives there bring everything across, run position material, those three degrees of freedom material come away from that residual for six and we still have 15. So uh, fairly straightforward, but you know, we can see helps us define things coming across. What's a random effect? One's, what's, a, what's a fixed effect? So run position and then of course our error term are going to be random. Go through that quick. This time will start eating up on us. So again, we have our distributional assumptions about those. So here's 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 my here's my slide for our users. <laughs> so we can fit the model in jump again our fixed effects and our random effects, um, or we can use the drop down um, under attributes if we're in the least square uh, standard least squares personality to define the random effects. In R, typically I've used the, the LMER and the LME4 package to fit um, to fit a mixed model. So there's sort of the basic syntax for that. So it defines the run and the position. This is how the, the random effects get defined. And then to get your results out. So here we are in jump. Again, looks like a pretty good fit by our, our plots up there. 
We have our variance components for run, position, and, and residual. Does look like we have, you know, we have as much, essentially as much variation in runs and positions as we do in the residuals. So that's probably a good thing that we've blocked on those. Um, and we get our fixed effect tests, material. Yep, there is a difference going on in the materials. We can take a look at those multiple comparisons. We get our least squares means estimates. Take a look at those. So it looks like um, material A has sort of the highest amount of shrinkage and material B the least. Look at the least squares means plot. So there we can sort of visualize B looks, you know, certainly B is less than A, maybe, maybe not uh, significantly different from C and D. Um, in in jump for our multiple comparisons, we just showed that before. So here's a dialogue there. It's under the red triangle menu to we can get um, choose our effect that we're interested in, select our all our pairwise comparisons. In this case, we'll look at the two key. We could just do a student's T. Or if we had a control, um, you know, if one of these materials was a control material, you know, here's the cotton shirt that we have always used. <laughs> Let's compare what happens to everything to the cotton. We could certainly use uh, say a Dunnett's. Um, uh, uh, adjustment if we have that control. So we add the Tuki and we look and yes indeed A is different from all of the others but it doesn't particularly look well B is different from C as well okay oh A is not different from C I forgot that one but sort of maybe borderline because it's 0 0.06 so maybe different maybe not you know again not a very big experiment so it's hard to say, you know, we just maybe didn't have enough power to detect, you know, the difference that's, uh, looks like about four units on that one. Um, but certainly B, you know, is better than, than the rest. Although, oh, it's not different from D. It catches up with me every time. Um, so B and D, not particularly different. A and B, A and, A and D, and then B and C. Or perhaps... You know, and again, high shrinkage is bad, so we want B is better. You know, maybe material B, maybe material B was our reference material. So is anybody is anybody doing as well as as that? And so we can do the Dunnett adjustment. Um, and in this case, we end up with um, I don't have the p values here, but if we look, just look at the confidence intervals, we can see that A and B and C and B are you know, those confidence intervals don't cross zero, whereas the D and B do. So if we if if we if we want um, in a, in a talk earlier today, we were talking about equivalence tests. I can't conclude that D and B are equivalent, but they're certainly not statistically different here. We could run an equivalence test if we wanted um, to see if they are equivalent, if we, if we want to make sure that we don't have something different from what we already have. Or maybe, um, well, no, in this case, high shrinkage is bad. So we, we want to keep things as close to, as close to what B is already doing. Um, so, so there we have it. So in summary, we can have the multiple random effects, just like we have multiple fixed effects. Um, and so we have that, those restrictions on the randomization to the treatment. So in the case of our Latin square, we were restricted to you know, how many runs we had and how many um, um, positions we had. And so that's sort of our special restriction in the case of that, that Latin square. And there's, you know, there's, in the same way that there's like a million variations of the split plot, there's a million variations on, on this sort of design where you have multiple random effects as well. Questions on this part? All right. Excellent. So here's sort of the last topic for today. Um, there's a whole lot more to mix models, but I only have 90 minutes. <laughs> Yes, oh, we do have one from online. Okay. Yeah. What does high shrinkage is bad mean? Oh, so in this particular example, um, it just means that when we're measuring the shrinkage, if, 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 if we have a lot of shrinkage, you know, if I buy a shirt and it shrinks a lot the first time I wash it and so it no longer fits, that's, yeah. that's not a good thing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So in this case, we don't want to have a lot of shrinkage. We want to keep that number small. And so, you know, so in this case, we're looking for sort of smaller is better. And depending, and that's that's context, you know, that's that's your subject matter expertise there, you know, as to whether a higher value is better or a lower value is better. In this case, a higher a higher value is is worse. Yep. And then why not use a fixed effect? I'm sorry. Why not use a fixed effect? As why a follow up? 
So why not use a fixed effect for, I'm not sure. I, I think it, it's a mix so, between the trinkets of the clothes and the clothing and then the statistical. Oh yeah, so yeah, so in this case, shrinkage was our measurement, it was our response. So it's not our, it's not the statistical shrinkage when we, th when we think of es shrinkage estimators. Um, so the, joy the joys of language. <laughs> Statistics borrowed language from other places and so we get, we get confusion. Two countries separated by a common language, right? <laughs> okay. So our last topic for today, and this sort of leads into sort of the extensions beyond um, what we have time for today um, with, with um, sort of multiple um, repeated measurements type things. So measurements over time and that sort of thing, uh, which, which you can also fit using, using mixed models, but we don't have time for today. So if anybody's interested in that, talk to the planning committee and have me come back and talk about that in a, in a future year. Uh, but we're gonna look sort of at re a regression um, and what we call random coefficients or multi-level models. So we're gonna briefly just refresh, you know, what is simple linear regression? We're gonna talk about what happens if the slope and the intercept are correlated when we're fitting that, that response line. So if we look at our picture here, it looks like, um, you know, somebody who starts out at a, at a higher level sort of grows faster. Um, you know, the, the rich get richer sort of, sort of idea. If you start higher, you finish higher because you've already started out so well. Whereas somebody who started much lower, they didn't grow as fast. Um, uh, so, and there's, there's a relationship uh, between sort of models with different names and, and I'll talk about that in just a minute. So just to refresh, simple linear regression, <laughs> if you have a continuous predictor X and a continuous response Y, it's classic simple linear, linear regression. So if we think way back in the day, in my case, back in the late 80s, um, you know, when we took geometry, we described the relationship as Y equals MX plus B. Statisticians, we love our Greek letters and also reinventing the wheel. Um, so our equation is Y equals mu plus beta X. <laughs> But those meanings of mu and beta are the same as b and m. It's our intercept and our slope. But of course, we flip them again because mu is m and beta is b. <laughs> so just to make things confusing in all the ways. Uh, but in geometry, we usually only have two points, right? We're in geometry, we've got our two points and we're going to define our line. In statistics, hopefully we have more data, right? Hopefully we're not going to define a line just on two points. Um, sometimes we have to make do, right? And so I have a note in here, I said, I'm a statistician, I can make fun of myself. So. <laughs> and then the least squares algorithm is usually what's used uh, when we're fitting, in just a simple linear regression case. Um, so when we're fitting that best line uh, between the points that we observed. No simple linear regression that's basic. We all have more than one factor these days, right? So we could have multiple predictors. It could be a factorial treatment design with or without interactions. That's when we're in multiple regression land. We could have curvature in the response over the predictor. We could have a polynomial regression, or, an, or it could be a nonlinear sort of curve, uh, nonlinear regression. And then we can measure sort of multiple subjects. So we have, we have um, you know, so if anybody has kids, you've got, you've had, you, when you take the kid in for the doctor as they're growing up, they're comparing their height and their, and their, and their weight to the, the growth charts, you know, what percentile you're in. This is, this is, this is where this came from. We, we have these multiple subjects, whether they're people or plants or um, whatever we're measuring, and we're going to fit this curve um, or line on it. So it's mixed model territory. Um, in the statistics world, we refer to these usually as random coefficient models. If you're coming from a social science background at all, you might have heard them referred to as a hierarchical linear model. Um, it, they're also closely related to what's known as an empirical Bayes model, if, you're, if you live in Bayesian land at all. We can get what are known as subject-specific regressions. So besides fitting sort of the population line, we can get a line for um, you know, the, the individual person or plant or whatever that we measured. See, I'm, I'm, my agriculture background is showing. You guys aren't, probably aren't working with plants. <laughs> and then, like we saw in that picture, we could have correlation between the intercept and the slope. 
So our example here is a stability trial. The manufacturer wants to determine the shelf life of a new product. They sample three batches over time at several predetermined times, measuring the fizziness at each time. At the time I came up with this, ex with, with this description, it was right when those, um, the hard seltzers were coming out. <laughs> So I said, pretend we're, you know, we're making a new hard seltzer and we're measuring the fizziness. And if that hard seltzer is flat, it's probably not going to be very good. And so we want to we uh, find the time at which the fizziness drops below acceptable limits. In this case, we're going to call it 90 on whatever this fizziness scale is. Um, you know, this is the, basically the idea for finding shelf life, say, for pharmaceuticals, although there are very specific regulations for finding shelf life for pharmaceuticals. So, so if you're doing that, follow your regulations. <laughs> and so we can go through the process again for our coming up with our model. We have our batches, three of them, and our observations within the batch. We had um, seven time points that we were looking at. Um, so seven minus one times the three batches for 18 degrees of freedom, total of 20. Um, in this case, we have a regression context. So we're looking at um, just, a, essentially, we're just looking at a a linear effect due to months. So we just have a single degree of freedom that we're looking at. We had seven months. We could fit some sort of polynomial if we wanted. They think it's a linear response, so they're not going to fit anything more than a linear effect. Then we come over, we have the batch, we have the month, and then we can have this batch specific effect. We can have how that how that line changes depending on which batch we're in. So that's basically the batch by month interaction. So this is kind of the, um, it's sort of like the whole plot that we saw um, variance, but it's not, you know, it's not the same thing, but you know, we can have that sort of, um, that, that, um, that batch specific uh, slope in this case. And then we have sort of the residual variance there. So our model gets a little more complex here. We have our y, we have our overall intercept beta zero. We can have um, essentially the effect due to batch lives here with the, the, the sort of the batch specific intercept, the B zero sub i. We have our overall, inter our overall slope, our population slope of beta one times whatever month we're in. And then we can have the, this batch by month. So your, your batch specific, um, the slope um, times the month and then our error term. And so the point that's sort of different here is this batch specific intercept and slope. This is where we model the correlation. So maybe something that's had a higher intercept grows faster or possibly the other way around. Maybe they start out, but because they started out high, they don't have as much to grow. So they are sort of flatter. You know, so the correlation could be negative as well. It doesn't have to be a positive correlation. I, I tend to think in terms of a positive correlation, but it could be the other way around. And so we model that um, sort of as a joint um, multivariate normal um, for, our, for our random effect here. And so we get the variance for the, the slope and the intercept, but also the, the covariance term. And then uh, the usual residual error. Did it turn off the pointer there? OK. So in jump, this is a little more complicated to um, to specify, is it playing? There we go, yes. No? Pause, there we go, okay. So we can add our response y to the y. I'm going, my, my, my video is slower than I'm talking. Month is our fixed effect. In the case of a random coefficient model, we have to switch, this is where we have to use the, the pro personality of, of mixed model. Um, because it's what allows us to fit that random coefficient. So we can add, and here's the tricky part for, for our, our uh, random coefficient model. We add the month first, because remember, we're going to have that, that batch-specific month effect. And then the batch was our subject, and we click this nest random coefficients button along with the month. And so then we end up with, we have our intercept there and our month um, identified, and it's, it's flagged then as a random coefficient. So a little bit different for, the, for defining those terms because of the, the, the funky nest random coefficients. Then just click run and it will fit the model. Don't replay it, there we go. Um, 
So for those of you who may be using SAS, um, you don't need to play. Thanks. Um, there's the SAS code. You could do it in proc mixed or proc glimix, either one. Um, your class statement is the batch because that's our, our class. Um, that's a nominal effect. Our model there, just y equals month. I tend to always specify the DDFM equals KR2. That's the Kenward Roger adjustment. Um, in the case of sort of spatial models and stuff, that becomes an important thing to do. So out of habit, I always do it. For a model like this, it's probably not going to change your degrees of freedom from, from the default um, that's in SAS. But out of habit, I always add it because in other cases, it does make a difference and it is important to include. And then your random statement, you have random intercept and month. And then to get that co random coefficient, you specify the subject as batch and include this type equals un. So it will, it'll fit an unstructured covariance structure to that. So we get both of those variances and, and the covariance. Unfortunately, I don't know how to fit this one in R. So if anybody knows, you can let me know. Um, so then we look at the results. You know, pretty good fit. We take a look. We can see our variance, and our here's where we see our those two variances: the the intercept and the month. Bring that pen back. Um, and then the covariance between the intercept and and the slope. And in this case, our covariance is not very big, just 0.02. Um, if we look at say the confidence interval and the p-value, I'm I'm, you know, it's only three batches. So we don't have a whole lot of <laughs> we don't have a whole lot of information there when we're estimating these variances and covariances. Um, some people will, so I always I always I tend to ignore sort of the the p-value section in the in the covariance parameters because um, variance component distributions are skewed. It's doing a walled interval and a walled p-value, which assumes the sym symmetric stuff and. They're typically not very accurate, particularly when we only have three batches. Some people will be like, nope, it's not significant. We need to remove that term from the model. It's overcomplicating our model. Um, so let's see what happens in that case. But we can see we do have you know, our effect of, of intercept in month. Um, so it looks like about 99.7. And then over time, it, it tapers off at about a rate of just a little less than 0.2 um, per month. So if I want to do a reduced model, um, it's essentially we're going to fit the same, um, same as we had before at our y and our month, and then but then in our random effects. Um, so I, re I recalled here and it brought that in. Um, so I want to remove that with the random effects, and we're just going to add the batch and the batch by month um, terms. So we'll add the. Yeah, it's, it's batch within month in this case. Um, and so then I'm going to get those. Um, so I'm going to get individual um, regression um, intercepts and, and slopes. But we said there wasn't, there was sort of negligible covariance. So we're not going to include the covariance term there um, in this time. And so in the case of SAS, you know, the model stays the same. We just remove the type equals UN that we had before. <coughs> Excuse me. We can take a look. You know, if we wanted to sort of formally test, uh, do we have, do were we okay with removing that covariance term from the model? We can do just a likelihood ratio test. Uh, and it's sort of borderline. You know, technically speaking, you know, our our, our statistic is three point oh five and our critical value three point eight four. I don't know. Um, yeah, again, we only had three batches. Maybe we should have left it in the model because we only had three batches. I'm not particularly concerned about it because it didn't seem like it was that strong of a, of a of covariance of a correlation there between those two. So we'll just go ahead and sort of wrap out uh, the analysis, leaving it out. You know, if I wanted to be sort of fully correct, maybe I'd go back and add it in and finish my my analysis with it in because it's it's sort of right at the gray stage of should I include it or shouldn't I? So, OK, I fit this model, but remember, I was trying to come up with the shelf life, right? How do, how do I then do this? You know, I want to I want to make sure that my my response stays above 90, given, you know, my parameter estimates that I have. And so, you know, we have our, our fixed effect parameter estimates. We also have those 
batch specific um, intercepts and slopes included in our in our um, in our output, so that those are you know the the B, beta zeros and the B zero i's, and so we can sort of compute those those batch specific um, predictions. So we want to we want to find that month after which the product is expired. So we're looking for you know if if we get below ninety, we're in in in, in no go land with our fizziness. We don't know which batch is the worst necessarily. So I want to take a look at all three batches. And I want to, you know, I want to do a lower confidence interval because I want to say, you know, sort of what my, what's that earliest point in time that I that I might hit this um, this 90, uh, 90 on the fizziness scale. And then I also check the the confidence interval with respect to an individual rather than the expected response. So basically, I'm predicting for any future batch, right? So there's sort of the additional variability of that, that future prediction. So it's like, it's sort of, it's, it's, real, it's sort of the difference between a confidence interval and a prediction interval uh, with this, um, the interval with respect to, res respect to an individual or an expected response. So I'm looking at an individual response, so I need to, to include a little bit more variability because I don't know what my next batch is particularly gonna be. Maybe it'll be a great batch, maybe it'll be a bad batch. I wanna, I wanna hedge my bets. So then once I fit that, I get an inverse prediction here. And so we can see, it's very small on my screen, that I have predicted months there of 47, 67, and 46. So it looks like batch three is sort of the worst performing. And then when I look at the confidence intervals, it is down there for that lower bound of 38, about 38 and a half months. Um, so that I would probably set my, my uh, shelf life for my product at about 38 months. Now, Tom did a great talk this morning about extrapolation control. I only had measurements out to 24 months, and I'm saying, hey, this is no good at 38 months. Well, I've probably extrapolated beyond my data, but I don't have much choice in the matter because I don't have data that far, and I have to sh set a shelf life because i got to get this product out, <laughs> out the door. And so I'm probably going to just have to deal with the fact that I am extrapolating beyond my data. But it's something to bear in mind, and maybe next time, if I want to improve the product or whatever, let's extend my testing, say, for another few months. Um, but you know, three years of, uh, of, a, of a product sitting on the shelf, waiting for it to, to be able to test its shelf life, you know, that's money down the drain, right? If I'm putting out something in the in the into the into the world, this was this was basically set up on the on the design of um, the requirements for. Um, the FDA, where it's, they specify out through 24 months, I believe, for their regular, and then they, it, it's a different process to get their shelf life, but the, the basic design of this was set up the same as for that. <clears throat> so to summarize this section, random coefficient models used with, um, are just used with linear regression when the, that intercept and that slope might be correlated. We could get just a mean prediction equation, that population average, just the beta, beta zero and beta one, but sometimes those subject-specific equations are of interest. We refer those to refer to those as BLOPs, the best linear unbiased predictors, because that'll help us um, identify sort of what's the worst performing one, and so we can use that to, to determine, say, our shelf life. So, question: yeah. How do I recognize that? Am I doing that beforehand or afterwards, or I guess either? Def How do I know when I'm in that situation? In in terms of random coefficient, I may need that model. Um, so basically, anytime when I'm measuring, when I if I think that there's potential, you know, if I'm measuring a subject over time in this, like in this case, or or whatever, okay. uh, and and I'm going to be doing some sort of regression, and I think there might be differences between um, sort of you know person to person, or you know whatever my experiment unit is. And it, and it, you know, I just always start with let's include that covariance because maybe there is a correlation. Maybe in past knowledge, I know that there's a correlation. You know, so, um, so that's sort of where we're at. There's nothing in the residual analysis that would tell you that. Not that I am aware of. I'm getting outside of my subject matter expertise. <laughs> I need, I need my friend, the graduate student, who did all of her research on, on uh, shelf life. Uh, she'd probably be able to answer that better than I can. I'm not sure. Um, because, you know, because with the residuals, 
it's our usual tool for figuring out, right, did we do something wrong? Right, right. I mean, yeah. I mean, because whether you include the covariance or not really isn't going to affect the residuals that much because the residuals are really a, a sense of normality and that sort of thing. And so I'm not sure that it would show you anything different if you include it or if you don't. This is pulling the variability. It's pulling that variance out of the model, right? Right, yeah. Okay. So just a quick wrap up because we only have a few minutes left. Woohoo! We made it through the end. Uh, so mixed models are critical whenever we have sort of restrictions to our randomization of those treatments. So we have a block, and so we're restricted um, with split plot sort of restrictions. Um, if those restrictions, those blocking factors, are a sample from a larger population, treat them as random. <laughs> so you get more appropriate estimates of the variability about those, so those treatment effects, those fixed effects. In our split plots, that those mixed model, uh, it ensures that we have the proper variance estimates for making those tests for the whole plot and the split plot factors. So we saw that our degrees of freedom for that whole plot dose were, were the, the whole plot degrees of freedom, and the others, it was the residual degrees of freedom. And the skeleton ANOVA process, which I really think, I think it's an amazing thing. <laughs> I, when I started grad school, uh, Dr. Shu hadn't come up with it yet, and it was it was a couple of years later, and it was like this mind blowing. Oh my gosh, we know we can fit. The, you know, I can take this really complex um, experiment description and and get it into a shape that I can understand what's going on. You know, we had this one where there was this center pivot irrigation, and then there were strips going this way and strips going that way, <laughs> and you know, be able to take this crazy design and yet still get sort of the right model um, out. Um, so thank you so much. Again, um, if you're interested in sort of this, the, the deep dive mathematical details, the SAS for mixed model, Mixed Models book um, has all sort of all, all of the sort of the deep math that's behind um, behind these. The jump for Mixed Models books, if you're if you're a jump user, um, it's more like this. We don't get there's a little bit of math in it, but we tend to do it sort of in this um, in this vein. Present the experiments to get you an idea of what's going on and how to fit them and and um, and interpret the results. Because typically, as scientists and engineers. You're not so interested in the deep math behind things, right? You just want your answers. So we sort of say, okay, we're going to present it to you, you know, in that in that form. And so if you want the statistical details, go read go read this this the SAS version. Those are really kind of the the top references that I have for for mixed models, um, sort of in general for research. So any last questions as we sort of wrap up today? Well, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Um, it's been a great audience. Very great, great questions came from you, so I, I appreciate it. And um, it's lovely doing this in front of people because <laughs> I've done a couple of versions of it just to the Zoom screen, and it's just not quite the same. So thank you so much. <laughs>